You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have David Burns and Austin Young from FallenFruit.org to talk about the placement of fruit trees throughout urban spaces as a means to cultivate community and food security. Fallen Fruit is a collaborative art project that began in Los Angeles in 2004 with the mapping of public fruit. That's fruit that grows on or over public property. Their projects include diverse site-specific artworks that embrace public participation, which encourage the public to experience their city as a fruitful, generous place, inviting people to engage in sharing and collectively exploring the meaning of community and collaboration through public participation and exhibition projects. Fallen Fruit was originally conceived by David Burns, Matthias Wiegener, and Austin Young. Since 2013, David and Austin have continued their collaborative work. Fallen Fruit uses fruit as a common denominator to change the way we see our world. Welcome to the show today, gentlemen. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Absolutely. Yeah, hey, it's great being here. Perfect. So I shared a bit about you two. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path that you took to get to where you're at now with the Fallen Fruit Project? Um, yeah, we we uh, started in the, in our own neighborhood, which I think is one of the really great things about the origins of Fallen Fruit. Uh-huh. Um, we didn't try to make a project that, you know, went around the world. It was something we thought about when we were initiating the project. But I think what's really important is that we looked at where uh, we came from and the context in which our um, lifestyle uh, was was expressing itself, and we created the core thoughts about the project around that. We started in 2004, and at the time there was three of us. Um, Matthias Wigner also was in the was one of the founders, and mm-hmm. it was really before you know the green movement had really yeah. taken off, or or people were thinking about food in public space, mm-hmm. and. We we were thinking about how LA is such a car, car culture, and people don't know their neighbors. So it's like you leave your house and you drive three blocks to go to the store, which people, which of course you do, mm-hmm. and then pass um, you know lemons and tangerines and all kinds of fruit in public space along the way. At least in our neighborhood, right? So. It was pretty exciting to sort of think about the idea of mapping that resource uh, that that existed, and sort of we I think we really shined a light on on it. Yeah, I mean to add on to that, what was so funny is that we knew that there was a lemon down the road, and we might call each other, be like, "Hey, are there still lemons over there?" Instead of going to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or whatever. Wow. But. But what was funny is when we actually walked the neighborhood, I think the first time we did it, it took really a long time because we didn't know exactly what we were looking for and what we right. were doing. But we found over 100 trees in five city blocks. So it wasn't like, you know, we pulled a thread and found a pile of, of yarn. I mean, that's really kind of what happened. We realized this, is, this isn't this is a joke. This is real. That's that a- people were really ignoring a resource. That is a great metaphor. I love that. So I, I want to clarify something. You found over a hundred fruit trees in five yeah, blocks. One hundred fruit trees. I mean, we found avocados, peaches, figs, um, tons of loquats, lemons. There was calamondins, which are Filipino limes. Right. I'm trying to think of what else is on this map. I mean, it, it was banana trees. I mean, it was just so abundant that it really changed the way we thought about what a city could be. Uh-huh. But to, to clarify, um, these trees because there's many more fruit trees than that right um these trees were all either in public space or it, in somebody's yard but the branches were hang, hanging well over the sidewalk in a public space yes yeah, so so we were only thinking about trees that that were available to the public without you know trespassing right and also then began to consider who is the public and who has the right to 
the fruit that is within public space. Wow. I mean, that's true. I mean, one of the things that we immediately got concerned about was this idea of located citizenship. I mean, who makes a community? Is it the stranger and the passerby as Uh much as the family that's been there for 50 years? I mean, I think a community and the way we think about public is an idea that we, as a large group of people, meaning the whole planet, should really think about what that means in a 21st century kind of way. I think we have a chance because of social media and... Mm -hmm. And the way the way language performs itself and the way interactions happen, that temporary community is just as important as long term. Right. You, you used a word located citizenship. Yeah. What does that mean that I've not heard that before? Well, we were thinking about what citizenship is in specific locations and geographies and, and how that how that meaning might be transient that you can be a part of something because you're there and then you can be a part of a different type of citizenship maybe because you have a California state ID or an Arizona state ID. Oh, right. Uh, so so that the, your, 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 your expression of citizenship isn't necessarily absolute. Mm-hmm. And how does that fit into the, the Fallen Fruit Project? Well, we believe everyone has a right to be everywhere they need to be. So we're all for everything. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know what that means, but... I, I, think, I, <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't know what that means either, but I, go ahead. I think, I think it's interesting to, when you're looking at, just like in a, in the most basic sense, when, when you, if I have a tree in my pro, on my property uh-huh. and I might consider that mine, my tree, right. but if, if the branches were hanging over a public space, am, is that, is that part of the tree still mine or is it, the, is it the public's and, and if it, you know, if it is still mine, am I willing to share that fruit that's at least within public space? Yeah. I think it brings up different, I think it kind of touches on ideas of can we share? Do we have enough to share? Uh, and also, I think it really talks about the way the public cities deal with public space also, which, <laughs> you know, fruit trees are in pretty much every city in the U.S. are, are not. Right allowed in public space or to be planted in public space or in mm-hmm. parks. So cities like Seattle or San Francisco um, or in, and even L.A. are really trailblazing in, in accepting fruit as a possible plantings. But I think the idea that, you know, f- we think fruit should be allowed in public space and that there's a lot of prejudices against fruit. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of them are unfounded. And so the idea that we could use public space as a place where we could share a resource that could be free for everyone uh-huh. instead of using it for ornamentals or grasses or, or watering things that, 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 I mean, beauty is a wonderful thing, but, but fruit trees are beautiful and they give. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that nice? Well. Yeah. There, there's something, I think what Austin's saying is so important to call out and focus on. One of the things that we learned earlier in the project, meaning in the first few years, mm-hmm. is we realized from making so many maps and visiting so many cities that fruit trees are actually you know, kind of residents of a neighborhood longer than most people who live there. Yes. A fruit tree can be productive for 40, 50, 60 years easily. and. Uh-huh. In most climates, if the tree is appropriate for that that location, mm-hmm. the tree is drought tolerant. It actually doesn't really want anything back. That being said, the majority of fruit trees in urban space are are ironically organic. And it's funny that their carbon footprint for picking oranges or apples is really as far as you feel like walking <laughs> instead of having them shipped literally halfway around the world. Around the world, exactly. Exactly. So here's my question for you. I'm on your website right now and I'm looking and there's a bunch of maps here of different cities. And so make the connection from, all right, you're walking in your neighborhood and you find uh, over a hundred fruit trees in, you know, five blocks to 10 years later, you have all these maps from around the world. Where there's as fruit as, yeah. As soon as we made our first map, we just got we got so excited and we uh-huh. thought, oh, you know, this we're on to something. This is an awesome idea. Right. So we we immediately thought, you know, we're going to continue this project. We're going to make a website and we're, we'll map, you know, the entire world. We'll map we'll map every city for for fruit. So that that's pretty much, 
you know, I mean, how we started. We just, then we, I think our next city we mapped was Santa Fe. And people immediately kind of, who saw our project, they, mm-hmm. they immediately got excited ab- about it. Like right away, I think we got an interview with NPR. You know, just kind of like, you just feel that the idea was was a good one. Right. So we just started mapping as much as possible. And at the time, you know, in the 2004, 2005, we, I don't even think there was geotagging uh, no, available. No, no, there wasn't. As, as said, but we just, but we purposely thought we're going to make hand-drawn maps and maybe we won't put exact locations, but mm-hmm. we'll put, you know, kind of rough locations so they become more like treasure maps. Oh, something, right. Something Interesting. to discover a neighborhood. And then we really thought about, you know, promoting, promoting them as ways to meet your neighbors, meet people on the street and get to know your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So we saw it as a social map in a way. Wow. Yeah, so, and we, we only mapped places we were invited to. I mean, if we mapped everywhere, we could just keep going. And right. there's no limit because there are so many great examples. We decided that one of the constraints would be uh, an invitation. And that might, because the maps might seem random. If somebody looks at our website, they're like, wow, why did you map Norway? And then map you know, Spain or whatever. Uh-huh. It's <clears throat> all of those geographies were determined by simply someone who had some form of ability to invite us. Uh, well, that's a, at the same to come out and take a walk around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean at the same time though, they were also often connected with larger exhibitions or projects we were doing in those cities. Uh. And and one and another thing is is we really only mapped we we would really go through a, through a city and really look for neighborhoods that were really abundant with fruit cuz not every neighborhood is you know it's like it's it's LA, some some neighborhoods we found to be more generous than than others mhm so your website fallenfruit.org which is the first map Silver Lake, that's uh, the neighborhood that the three of us lived in. And it's kind of triangular in shape mm-hmm. uh, because we each of us lived kind of near one of the points of that of that shaped map. You said Silver Lake? Yeah, the Silver Lake map. Ah, Fallen Fruit of Silver Lake. Here we go. That's the first one, so 2004. I'm... Wow. So there's a lot of citrus on it. Looks like some, <laughs> looks like some figs. Yeah, there should be passion fruit, I would guess. Mm-hmm. Maybe some pomegranates. I'm just going from memory. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting now though, like when when we first mapped, the the fruit was super abundant. Like you would go and you could pick a lot of fruit. But, <laughs> but now, you know, now the fruit's usually picked up until the fence line. Uh-huh. Um so it really entered consciousness about you know foraging and and you so after all this mapping we really started then to think about planting trees and and i think we've switched switched our focus now to be to be about planting and then mapping those trees that we're planting ah very good very good so on a on a more cultural level what what kind of impact have you seen from this so if you if you've been if you if you started your urban farm project in 2001 I mean I think you're you're really at you know you could call yourself at the forefront of a of yep. a, a movement. Oh yeah. And definitely I, I think, Pardon me? Definitely you guys are at the forefront of this movement. Yeah. I mean people have been foraging for thousands of years so I wouldn't say that we were really at the at the very forefront of it. Um, as a matter of fact, we got our name from from a Roman law that's in the Bible, um, in Leviticus, uh-huh. that, that talks about um, not not harvesting your fields to the edges and and to leave the fallen fruit for the stranger and passerby. So, wow. but it did seem new in two thousand four, you know. And I think at the timing, if you time that with the collapse of the economy mm-hmm. in two thousand seven, and then. You know, by 2008, I think there are a lot of people 
even before then, um, a lot of people sort of being inspired by our project, recreating it in their own cities. There's um, and which which now, whenever we travel in every city, there is a some kind of foraging group, some mm -hmm. kind of tree project. Um, I would I would say, and and I'm not, and I don't mean this in an egotistical way. I would say that we inspired that movement. Yeah, I would and, say so. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the things that's so interesting about you know being a part of this cultural shift is the the collective change of consciousness mm -hmm. about how we think about the space around us and how we think about our resources in kind of neighborhoody ways, which are really localized. That means you can walk that distance to me. That's what makes a neighborhood. How far can you walk? Right. And and then we think about it in terms of global at the same time. I mean. What's so unique about the 20th century is that the 20th century was really trying to push these ideas of, you know, supermarkets and global transportation and telecommunication. And, and so quickly, it seems like the turn of the century, meaning really 15 years ago, there was a whole bunch of people who were questioning if that was such a great idea mm -hmm. and creating projects like what you're doing and, and what we're doing and a whole bunch of other people doing similar things with bicycles or other technologies that don't right. that are not determined by fossil fuels that are really social and that really em embrace everyone like anyone can do it there's no qualification necessary or prerequisite except and, except to just go out and do it Except the impulse to do it, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's, that's, you know, part of what's so great about this time in, in history in the United States and, and farther. When we first started in 2004, our neighborhood in Silver Lake was not a walking neighborhood, and neither was L.A. in general. Right. And, and the city ha has made it a real, like, goal and they they have all these incredible plans in place to really turn the city into a walking place that's going to be enjoyed by the public and mm -hmm. and and connecting different neighborhoods and it, and it's been exciting for fallen fruit because we've we've gotten commission to do a couple of fruit parks we we're doing um we're opening our third one in 2016 just because because our project aligns with city policy and what's happening right here. And there's all this incredible stuff going, you know, I don't know if you've heard, I'm sure you have about the LA river. Um, it's being restored and there's wow. all sorts of artworks and walking trails and, uh -huh. and, uh, there's the downtown is completely transformed. And I, and I think that as a, as a project for the public fallen fruit has been able to be really a part of that change here. That is awesome. And it's not just about maps anymore, I'm hearing, right? No, we, um, we added on, it's starting in 2005 with different projects uh -huh. um, that engage the public. The, I think the first one that was notable is the public fruit jams, where we invited <laughs> the public to make jams on the side of, on sidewalks without using recipes. Really? It, yeah, you would negotiate by other terms, like if someone brought lemons and someone brought figs and uh -huh. I had lavender, we'd make lemon, lavender, fig jam and just share it. There was no money exchanged. Right. Kind of like 100 years ago. Yep. But but we've done projects since then to go back to Austin talking about us focusing on planting fruit trees. We realized that fruit trees, because they're in neighborhoods longer than most people, creating trails or systems of exploring a place connected by fruit trees. Mm -hmm. We call them urban fruit trails. And we're really excited about thinking about like connecting two metro stops or maybe a library to another landmark Ooh. where all throughout the year of that city, you could also perhaps, you know, snack along the way mm -hmm. that it might change the behavior of, of municipal space or interstitial space. The, the these types of engagements with the public are exciting to us. The ones that are active as well as passive. Yeah. So, and I'm, again, I'm on your website and I noticed that you had a project that happened on November 7th, Saturday, November 7th, called Park to Playa. Oh yeah, the, uh, tomorrow we, we, we're we doing, uh, a, we're planting fruit trees. Um, the, let's see, would it be LA County? Yeah, it's LA County. They they are doing this incredible Park to Playa Trail that's going to connect 13 miles of parks 
that go from um, the stock stalker. Is um, it stalker trailhead? Yeah, down to down to the beach. So at the at the trailhead, we're we're uh, putting in a a public fruit park where you could you know get snacks to bring with you uh -huh. down the trail, and um, so yeah, we're we're gonna celebrate tomorrow and plant plant the fruit trees there, and uh, I don't think it opens until 2016 though. Oh, perfect. So how many fruit trees are you planting? We're planting, I, um, unless the final numbers have slightly changed due to a variety of uh, details, mm -hmm. we're planting about 37 fruit trees. And the idea of that installation is that the park is ever bearing, meaning that every uh, time of the year you go there, yep. something's flowering and something's ripening. So nice. it was really about balancing the, not creating an orchard where it's a monocrop, right. but creating a place that's always providing you an opportunity. Sweet. I love that <laughs> metaphor. That is, <laughs> it yeah. No, it's wow. cool. There's going to be citrus and, and persimmons and pomegranates and stone fruit and apples and grapes. And so that, that message at the trailhead for this 13.2 mile course mm -hmm. that never hits public streets, that's what's so cool about oh, it. Oh, wow. You know, it's the first of its kind in LA, and we're really excited to be part of that part of that process. And it looks like Mark Ridley Thomas. It's his birthday. And yeah, he... he's a council member. He's a great guy. That's oh, true. very good. We need to uh, Peyton. <laughs> we need to get him on the show. You should. He's a huge champion for this stuff. He's he's easy. We could we could make that happen. How far out? Far yeah, out. his district. He he sort of shepherded us to make a the first public fruit park in California at Del Air Park in 2013. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, without his leadership and support and forward thinking, I do not believe that it would be possible to plant a public fruit park in California without someone like Mark Ridley Thomas. He oh. really understood the idea of um, embracing positive change in a neighborhood and the ability to think outside of the box when it comes to public art, that it doesn't have to be a mural nice. or cement. Yeah. Uh, public art could be many different things, and that fruit trees were appropriate now to be part of that material palette. I mean, we're really <laughs> grateful for getting to work with someone like him. That, well, that just to be just to be clear, um, yeah, please. You know, in in LA, you still cannot plant fruit trees in public space. So the way that we were, or parks. So the way that we were able to get approval for the the fruit park was to declare them sculpture. Oh, you know, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you because we, you know, there's a lot of pushback for liability reasons and for maintenance reasons from the municipalities. In fact, I was at a conference yesterday uh, talking exactly about this and fruit in public space and how do you get past the barriers that are, you know, our government entities put in place? Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's really case, hard. In the case of the, the three examples that we have been successful with so far, uh -huh. uh, Del Air Park in 2012-2013, in and then the Park to Plow tra Trailhead for 2015-2016, and then Stone View, which will be in 2016, all of them in L.A. Um, County, that we were, as artists, we were able to um, declare that the fruit trees were part of our art-making material, mm -hmm. and therefore it could circumnavigate other wow. considerations. Yeah, but but that doesn't mean that that we didn't have a lot of um, meetings hoops. and yeah. our arguments and hoops to jump through, which we did. Yeah, um, it, it, we we're planting uh, 200 fruit trees in Portland next weekend with um, with Caldera and Portland Art Museum and, mm -hmm. and the tree. Portland and the Portland Fruit Tree Project, and we're really excited about the kind of collaboration that's happened up in Portland. It's really it's it's exemplary. It's very very cool. Wow, uh, but but it's it's similar in Portland. They they've been trying to get uh, laws to go through that allow allow um, fruit trees in in parkways and public spaces. Mm -hmm. And so in the case uh, where this project went in just before that, which is which is also a really interesting thing about our urban fruit trails project is in really in order to sort of pass by these all these hoops you have to jump through. We're basically inviting anybody who has 
a place to plant that's next to a sidewalk mm. is you know whether it's a business uh yes apartment building a private home it, it you could plant the tree on private space but then have it overhang public space that's... therefore creating you know blurring the lines between public and private space and creating yeah. and still creating this incredible collaborative public art artwork that is in public space that's living yes. making fruit yeah that's brilliant <laughs> so that's two ways that's two ways you call it a, a you call it sculpture and then you park it park it on private land and have it hang over public yeah yeah it's pretty it's pretty amazing and then and then so what we're doing what we're working on doing is creating a map which we're going to call the endless orchard uh-huh and it's going to be an online map where you know you can plant map and share fruit and meanwhile it being a you know what we think might end up being the largest public artwork in the world. I have to say that left me speechless when you said that. It was like, <laughs> what do I even say to that? Because you can just add on the map. That's all you have. To do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We'll invite people to add onto the map. Seriously. Wow. I mean, one of the things that we've learned from all the work we do is that it's so easy to collaborate. Yeah. I mean, collaboration is just so much a part of culture and part of who we are as people yep. in the world. And collaboration just increases out, outcome and increases possibility. Yep. It does nothing else. I mean, people sometimes get these really funny ideas about proprietorship, like, oh, no, that's my thing. Right. But in reality, no, it's our thing. Yeah. And we really embrace that attitude about making something happen. And Urban Fruit Trails is just one example that we're really excited about. Um, it's, it's gotten... It's foothold in a bunch of different communities in the past year. We mm -hmm. have done an urban fruit trail in Omaha, Nebraska that connected 11 institutions across Omaha. Wow. Uh, we're working in Portland, and the scale is 200 fr trees that are free for anyone to um, take stewardship with and help make urban fruit trails that could be institutional but also private citizens. Um, the other cities are Riverside, Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. Uh, where else? New York in Manhattan. Um, the Bronx, it, the Bronx as well. The Bronx just added on to New York. I mean, it, it's really this this opportunity that anyone can get involved with. It's yeah. so easy to change the behavior and spirit and the context in which you live in a place. It's not that hard. We think it, we think that you know, fruit trees and the idea of I don't know how generous they are. I'd loved what you were saying about gen how generous they are. That was yeah. just, that's and they, wow. And they don't have like a criteria for, for their generosity. As a matter of fact, if you decide that, you know, you're going to take all the fruit off, uh -huh. off the tree, it's going to be really happy and just grow more. Right. So, so it's, <laughs> it's real. There's really, there's really no right or wrong way that a fruit tree can act or, or, you know, it's, it's just going to keep, keep giving, giving. Right. This I mean, that, that's one of the beautiful things about the work we do is that it really does embrace this idealistic concept that everyone's welcome and that generosity begets generosity. I mean, um, you can't really get mad at a banana. I mean, it's just never going to get, you know, <laughs> respond. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know? if, if anybody wants to be a part of our Urban Fruit Trails project, they can email us and we'll be sending out more information about it. Perfect. As well as when we have our Endless Orchard app mm -hmm. available to the public, you know, it, I think now is the time that we want to ask, ask people and invite them to, to sort of map and plant fruit trees that they can share so that, so that uh, by the time we, we release the Endless Orchard, that we have a really great infrastructure in place and it can be a real meaningful place for sharing and, and uh, you know, connecting with other, with other people who have fruit trees. Perfect. I think Austin's trying to say if there's somebody out there listening in a city we haven't done this in and wants to jump in the pool and <laughs> help build ur urban fruit trails in your neighborhood, just uh -huh. email us. We're totally game. Perfect. It doesn't have to be next week. It could be in three months or it could be in 25 minutes. Uh -huh. um, we're excited. The answer is but, yes. yes. But the, I think what I want to say is, you know, it's like it's not like it's not like we have to be there. 
to to create the project in your neighborhood. It, we're we're inviting people to do it themselves. Themselves. Also. That's the that's the big thing that I yeah that we got to get people to get. It's not about us. It's not about me doing an urban farm and coming and doing your urban farm for you. And it's not about you guys doing, uh, you know, these public displays of fruit and then going and doing it for somebody else. They got to jump in and do it for themselves. Yeah. Cause yeah. You- and, and what's so great is that if somebody has the ambition and the humanitarian spirit to take that kind of leadership in their own community Mm -hmm. and they need some guidance or support or they need some language to help approach the city Uh or the county in the right way well that's what we want to help with yeah like we can help with that part we've done it many times la is one of the hardest places to work (laughs) in america yeah and and we're happy to shepherd and we want people to take that kind of initiative to add on yeah. I don't, and I don't. to create a bigger expression of how communities can be in the 21st century that are sustainable and appropriate and generous and thoughtful. And collaborative. Yeah, and and I, I question how much guidance or support people might need. I mean, really, plant, take, a tra- take a tree I mean, buy a tree at the, at the store, plant it at the edge of your property next to a sidewalk, mm-hmm. and then, then you map it on our our site and and be willing to share it you could you you plant plant one in your backyard also so you feel comfortable that you have enough for yourself yourself. yeah because there's going to be like hundreds of pounds of fruit fruit on each tree yeah all right all the all of you that are listening out there it's that easy pick a fruit tree and plant it in a in a pseudo public place where people can come and pick it and share it i have uh, a row of citrus on the front of my property and I get this question on tours here. People say, well, what if people come by and steal it? And I just smile and say, uh-huh. Are they hungry? Let's eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's awesome. No, yeah. it's true. I mean, Austin and I are the same way. Austin has, uh, what do you have, a nectarine and an apple tree and grapes in front of your house. Mm-hmm. And, and I have apples and cherries um, and a pear tree. And I'm excited when I come home and I see that somebody's picked the tree. Yeah. That means somebody cared enough to do it. Yeah. I don't think of it the other way around. I get excited about someone being excited about it. About it, yeah. You know, it's weird though. You're not. I, I, I notice not everybody feels that way. Some people get really upset. So yep. I always say, like, you know, put a sign on your tree. It's like, don't, don't pick it. You know, yeah, like but... sample, don't hoard. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I have a question for both of you, and this is a, I know we've been having some deep conversations. What drives you? Like, what's your big why? Why do you do this? Because it's awesome. Because it makes me happy every day. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when you're able to do something that changes the place for everybody, you understand that there's a resonant effect that could inspire other people to explore similar things in their own way. Mm-hmm. Those are some of the reasons for me personally. I've never done anything that I've had more fun doing <laughs> um, that has made me smile more uh-huh. in my entire life. Wow. Austin is speechless. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, why, why do, what drives me? I would say, number one, I'm driven to make artwork, you know, and it's kind of awesome to make art that has an impact on people. Mm -hmm. And also I love people. So we get to meet all different kinds of people when, when we're, when we're working on our projects and, it's kind of incredible. It's just a great blessing. Yeah. I hear in both of your voices, great joy about this. Just it, and and it's, it's palpable. I'm feeling it over on the sides and that's, that's, I think that's part of the excitement that gets people into it is your joy about it. Well, I mean, how, how lucky is it to get to do something with your life? I know that always gives back to you. I mean, you know, the fruit tree is just a metaphor. The project we work on is an expression of it. Mm-hmm. The The amount of, of positive energy that we get to experience in places as guests is just really quite... Mind-blowing? 
Yeah, it's just great. Yeah. And, and you know, Austin said that he, we get to meet people, all kinds of people. That is not, that is not to be said lightly. We literally get to hang out with people that, you know, what we call in the U.S. homeless or what Austin and I like to say are people that don't have addresses. Mm-hmm. Like we hang out with people that just live on the streets as much as we hang out with people that, you know, run institutions or city government, you know, families and neighborhoods and people that don't speak the same language. And, you know, it's really remarkable to get to work with humanity at that breadth it's not the depth as much as it's the, the breadth, breadth of yeah. qualities of character that when you put them all together, it's what we call communities. And, yeah. and everybody's important in that way. And it's a really cool project to get to work on and get to experience. Nice. Austin? I think it's getting a little esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> I Sorry, love that, though. I am that guy. I mean, I, mean the, I think the truth about it is so much more complex because, you know, when you start working on it we worked started working on this project 11 years ago Mm -hmm. and as we the more we work with fruit the deeper things got and like the more you understand what what it what it meant to work with this growing you know medium as as an art medium as well as the public and and um it each each project that we do kind of expands that meaning and we so i i I don't even know if i can explain it more than that except that through years of working on this one subject it's become profound yeah yeah i can completely get that and you're doing you're doing a great job of expressing it both of you so i have one final question for you both what Final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Advice is hard to give to someone you've never met and who's not asking the question. Uh That being said, the advice I could give everyone in the world is to not hold back. Mm. Yeah. That if you have an idea or you want to do something, you know, embrace it and move it forward and ask people to help you. Um, that to me is how you don't hold back. I think that um, sometimes we think it's almost impossible to make a difference in the world, or or it, we think it is impossible. So you know what can we really do? But I think it could be as simple as planting a fruit tree in reach of of the public or the stranger or passerby, and and sort of. Uh, contributing even in a small way yeah perfect thank you so much for joining us today and sharing about your experience with fallen fruit Uh, what is the best way for our listeners to get hold of you well social media you could always look up fallen fruit um or the website fallenfruit.org perfect perfect Well, that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Interested in learning more and taking control of your food future? Text Urban Farm to 33444 to sign up for our weekly urban farming newsletter. Jam-packed with urban farming tips, stories from people just like you learning to urban farm, and free classes. The Urban Farm Lifestyle Newsletter will equip you to join the urban farming revolution. Text Urban Farm to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.